You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we're back with another episode dedicated to the Colonial Parkway murders. On the docket today is the Keith Call and Cassandra Haley case. Bill, you ready to talk? I am. We sort of stepped away from the Colonial Parkway murders, what, for a couple of weeks? A couple of weeks. While we recorded our two episodes with David Middleman of Othram. And we've gotten great feedback on those episodes. And now we're kind of back into exploring a bit more about the Colonial Parkway case. So Bill, situate us in time. Where in the sequence does Keith and Sandy's case actually fall? They come in at number three in terms of the incidents. Now, just so we can explain what our thinking is here, we're putting the first incident, Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski, and the third incident, the disappearance of Keith Call and Cassandra Sandy Haley, together for a couple of reasons, because they are the ones that actually took place on the Colonial Parkway, and they're both FBI cases. So we're taking them slightly out of order And then, of course, in the coming weeks, we're going to be getting to the murder of Robin Edwards and David Knobling, which is incident number two. That's the one that took place at Ragged Island. And then finally, the murder of Anna Maria Phelps and Daniel Lauer at the I-64 rest stop and or hunt club, which closes out the series of what is typically called the Colonial Parkway murders. There are a number of differences between the two cases that took place on the Colonial Parkway, but I would say that first and foremost, the biggest difference between those two cases is the fact that Keith and Sandy are considered a disappearance. Their bodies were never located. We have no evidence that they were murdered. We assume at this point it has been 34 years that if they could have come home, they would have come home. So we we go with the assumption that it is a probable murder. The biggest difference between the murder of Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski and Keith Call and Cassandra Haley is the fact that Keith and Sandy have disappeared and their bodies have never been located. Now, Bill, I remember you saying once that you had a conversation with your father in which he referenced the Keith Call and Cassandra Haley case and mentioned that he actually felt that maybe your family was the luckier of the two families. Do you know what I'm talking about? And do you want to expand on that story? It happened in January 2010 when the FBI took the highly unusual step of flying in the Colonial Parkway murders families and putting us up This is all at FBI expense, which I'm told is extremely unusual, in order to give us a five-hour briefing on the Colonial Parkway murders and what the status was of the FBI investigation into the Thomas Dowski murder and the Call Haley disappearance. For the benefit of new listeners, the other two cases in the Colonial Parkway murders actually didn't take place on the Colonial Parkway and therefore are handled by the Virginia State Police. But after a significant amount of family pressure in the fall of 2009, leading up to just after Christmas 2009 and then January 2010, the FBI brought us in to give us a status update. And I remember my dad, who has since passed on, kind of leaning forward when we were driving back from Newport News to Annapolis, Maryland, where my folks lived. My dad said something to the effect of, well, at least we know what happened to Kathy. We knew that Kathy and Becky had been murdered together, where their bodies had been found, and ultimately the bodies were returned to the families. In Kathy's example, she was actually cremated and her ashes were scattered at sea off a United States Navy ship. 
my dad made the point that, well, at least we know what happened to Kathy. Those words have resonated with me. And of course, as we've gotten to know the Call and Haley families, I understand quite a bit about what my father meant because I think in these situations like the Keith and Sandy disappearance, I actually think if it's possible, that experience is worse Mm -hmm. than losing someone, but knowing that they're dead and gone and whatever your religious or spiritual leanings are, whether you feel that they're in heaven or in some other place, but you have an idea and you're actually certain that they're dead. In getting to know the Colin Haley families over the years, it has really saddened me to listen to them speak about their loved ones. And there's always this little uncertainty mixed in and even a glint of hope, which I hope this comes out right. I'm not actually certain that that hope is necessarily realistic or even all that healthy. Yes, I understand that sometimes people walk back through the door who've been gone for more than 30 years and say, hi, mom, dad, I'm home, and stories like that. But they're mostly stories. And the truth is, I think that Keith Call and Cassandra Haley are dead. And it's very painful to hear the two families at different times speak about how much it would mean to them to have even a small remainder of their loved one returned to them so that they could be buried or handled in a way that was appropriate for those two families. You know, my dad's gone now, but I just remember him leaning forward in the car. He was in the back seat and and making that observation. And I think he spoke the truth. You know, we have had a number of conversations over the years, you and I. I remember the first time that you said you didn't like to use the word closure. And when you explained why, I completely understood why you don't like to use the word, because there is no sense of closure for a murder victim's family. But I feel like there is even less of a sense of that for the families of the Calls and the Haley's, because they have so many unanswered questions at this point. And I feel like we do need to acknowledge that every person who has wished for closure for this family or for these families, we you know, we thank you so much for those good wishes. And we know that not everybody looks at the word closure the same way that we do. Mm-hmm. But closure isn't really, it's not a word that we like to use because there really just is no way to have closure. And I'd say that goes doubly so for the Call and the Haley families. They have no idea where Keith and Sandy are. Even though we have received tips, some more probable than others, as to where they might be, it is 34 years on at this point and they have yet to be found. And that's that's got to just be so rough. There is no way to have closure if that's the word we were going to use. I like the expression, your mileage may vary, and Mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a flip way in this example. Speaking just for me and perhaps for my family, we're looking for answers. And it's funny, you just referenced that the Haley's and the Calls still have questions, which of course we all do. They just have additional questions and dare I say, I think additional pain just from the not knowing aspect of what happened. And we've touched on this in the past couple of episodes regarding the Colonial Parkway murders. At this point, we're looking for answers. And as we've talked about before, we may shift focus when suspects are properly identified in the Colonial Parkway murders. And if those suspects are still alive, our shift may be part of a prosecution. But at this point, that seems like such an far off in the distance fuzzy concept that it's really difficult to wrap your brain around the idea of having anger or justice or 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 a focus on an individual or perhaps individuals responsible for your loved one's death we're just not there and we haven't been there for so long at least for me it just feels like it's so alien mm-hmm. we're just not at that place My attitude might shift and perhaps other people's attitudes might shift. I know in talking about Sandy and Keith, it has to be incredibly painful. And of course, when we talked with Keith's sister and brother, 
Joyce and Chris in next week's episode, you tap into their pain. It's palpable and it's right under the surface, much in the same way. We had some lighthearted moments Mm -hmm. with, with Terry and Paula. They're delightful, wonderful people. There was laughter, but there were also tears. And even though we couldn't necessarily see each other, I mean, it's an audio format, I knew, and I think our listeners could tell, just how difficult this process has been for those two women and their families to go through. And I think you'll get more of that while at the same time discussing some really interesting aspects of the case and what the status of the case is when we talk with Joyce and Chris in these upcoming episodes. In the upcoming episodes, we do give Chris and Joyce a lot of props for the work that they have done in making sure that the information about the case is still out there on the internet. It is present, it is fresh. And, you know, they, as a family, as you mentioned, Bill, it's entirely possible that they have more pain behind this than some of the other families, but they have really leapt in, you know, both feet first in trying to make sure that all of the information about the case is out there. And they encourage people, come forward with leads, let us know of any tips. That is really something that I find very admirable, especially when you're still dealing with that level of pain and uncertainty. And probably, I I don't think I'm overstating it by saying anguish, all these many years later. These are are people who are still looking for answers and they are still willing to put themselves out there to do interviews and to do TV series so that somebody with answers may very well come forward and say, hey, I have information. Here's where you can find Keith and, and Sandy. I think all of us are committed to doing everything we can to keep the Colonial Parkway murders case alive, to keep the focus and media attention on the case and on our lost loved ones because we believe that's the only way this case is going to be solved. And much in the same way that doing something like these episodes of Mind Over Murder to talk about the case are so important to all of the family members. And we're going to be talking with other family members in the coming weeks as well as we try to really fully explore all four of the double homicides in the case. I admire these families immensely, and I find speaking to them very inspirational. It makes me want to renew our commitment to seeing this case through. I hope that we're able to convey a sense of hope and expectation to move this case forward. I hope it doesn't all come across as gloom and doom, because we are determined to see these cases through. Absolutely. So let's jump right into the particulars of the Keith Call and Cassandra Haley disappearance. Now, for those of you all who have watched Lover's Lane Murders, you are doubtless familiar with this aspect of the case. But for anybody who may just be jumping in as a first time listener, we do want to make sure that we cover the basics. And of course, we do hope that if you have questions about any aspect of the case that we do not cover in this episode, please feel free to leave those questions on our social media pages so that we can take care of them and address them in a bonus episode, say, because we do love answering listener questions and we do love bonus episodes. So if we do forget something, feel free to give us a shout about it on our Facebook page. So it is only 18 months after Kathy and Becky's murder on the parkway that Keith and Sandy disappear on the parkway. Have I got my math right there, Bill? You do. Now, we've had a second incident, which we'll we'll be talking about in more depth in the coming weeks, in the murder of Robin Edwards and David Nobling at the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge, which lines up to be almost exactly a year after Kathy and Becky's murder on the Colonial Parkway. So now we flash forward approximately six months or so to April 1988 and the murder of, presumed murder, I should say, Mm -hmm. of Keith Call and Cassandra Haley. Now, before we discuss the particulars under which they disappeared, let's actually talk about the place. Because as we know, the Colonial Parkway is not just one tiny stretch of road, it's a long stretch of road. Kathy and Becky's scene and Keith and Cassandra's scene are actually remarkably close together. Can you talk about the place on the parkway where both of these took place? The basics about the Colonial Parkway, of course, it's a 23-mile long ribbon of land. 
the place where Kathy's car, the Honda Civic, is found at the Cheatham Annex Overlook, and the place where Keith's Toyota Celica are found at the York River Overlook, are only about a mile or a mile and a half apart. You know, when we drive back and forth together, and I know you drive the parkway daily. Every day. It always seems like it's about a five-minute, very pretty drive, but they're both along the York River. And my first reaction to seeing the sites years ago was how similar they are. They're both these kind of shallow, paved, they were not quite as structured back then, pull-offs, which are designed to give you a place to pull up alongside the river and park get out of your car and you have these beautiful views of the York mm-hmm. River, which is quite deep and wide, very picturesque with Gloucester County, if I have my geography correct, yeah. on the far side of the water. It's very pretty. It's big enough and deep enough that Navy ships sail up and down going to the Cheetah mm-hmm. Annex Overlook. At Cheetah Annex, fully the operation is a place where ammunition is stored and loaded very carefully onto these Navy ships. But it's a big mm-hmm. river and it's wide and deep and flowing, I always think of it as to the right, downstream yeah. towards the Atlantic Ocean. The two scenes, to me, strike me as very, very similar. Now, Keith and Sandy, who would be going out of their way to end up on the Colonial Parkway, as I know we want to discuss, their site is kind of up on a bit of a bluff with woods, but still overlooking the York River. It's a very, very pretty picturesque spot. As we've discussed before, it is extremely close to the parkway itself, so it's not deep. Cars pulled up at the York River Overlook are completely visible to passing cars on the parkway. There's no woods or anything to obscure the cars that are parked there. And there's no privacy right? from my point of view. If you were a couple stopping, which I'm sure people do, but it's not a place with a lot of privacy or any kind of screening from brush or trees or anything like that. Exactly. And really, the only thing it has going for it in terms of privacy is that there are no lights around, but it is near the Cheatham Annex docks, and there are a ton of lights out on the docks. So the parking, and it's not even a parking area. It's, it's it, You're right, it is more like a half moon pull off. Mm-hmm. People can park there, but it, not for terribly long, especially because there are only maybe two to three cars that can fit into it at any one point. It is not a lit area. So that's really the only thing that would have going for it in terms of people wanting to park there to make out, have a drink or whatever. These are, yeah, these are very shallow and narrow pull-offs. So there's only about, as you said, a mile and a half of space between the two sites. And so that is important for our listeners to keep in mind. We want to try to situate you, especially for those of you that have never been to the parkway and maybe don't have any plans on getting there anytime soon. And at some point or another, I I think we would like to go through and take some photos or some video for all of you so that you can get a a good idea of what we're talking about. So we are April of 1988, and Keith Call is getting ready to go out on a date with Cassandra Haley. Now, Sandy and Keith were not a traditional couple. We know that Kathy and Becky were a a couple. They are probably the couple in the most traditional sense of the word. Keith and, and Sandy were not dating. In fact, Keith was taking a, oh, how did Joyce phrase it the other day? They were taking just a bit of a break with his girlfriend, his longtime girlfriend, Selena. So even though this was a first date for Keith and Sandy, I don't get the sense that it was going to be like a long-term relationship. I think it was probably just going to be like a one-off sort of date. Is that how it, does it it ring that way to you, Phil? Uh, I don't agree that it was necessarily going to be a one-off. All we know is they were going out on a first date. It it could have ended up being the greatest romance ever. It could have been, yeah. All I'm saying is they went out on one date and then they, they and again. then they disappeared. I yeah. don't know if you can draw a conclusion. Our recent conversations with the Call family might lead us to believe that Keith and Selena might have gotten back together. They had been a pretty serious couple for a high school dating relationship for several years. Who knows? So Keith was getting ready to go on his date with Sandy. We know that he stopped by his brother Chris's house to borrow a sweater and a jacket. And then we know that they were going to go to the movies. And then we know they were going to go to a party at an apartment complex near Christopher Newport University. 
There have been some questions as to what precisely may have gone on at that party on that particular evening. So Bill, do you want to kind of fill our listeners in on what we know about the party? And then we can talk about what we don't know about the party. For those of you that saw the Lover's Lane Murders television series, their friend describes a situation where there are a number of students going in and out of several different apartments at the Christopher Newport University apartments, called University Apartments. They're, they've been torn down since. So there were several different apartments open. There was a keg. People were having a, a fair amount of fun. Our understanding is that Keith was really watching himself He'd had some trouble and was being very careful about not drinking and driving and that kind of thing. What's notable is that Keith and Sandy seemed to spend most of the evening at this particular apartment in separate groups. Keith in the kitchen talking to a female friend of his girlfriend, Selena, and kind of the way I've always interpreted it as singing the blues a bit about the fact that he missed Selena. And then Sandy, who was a very pretty, very popular young woman, freshman in college, strikingly attractive cheerleader, was chatting with some guys that she knew, including a guy that she had dated discreetly for some time in high school and kind of had attracted her own little group of admirers who were chatting with her I think in the living room. From what we've heard, it doesn't sound like it was at least publicly the greatest date ever because Keith seemed to be spending his time in the kitchen talking to Selena's friend and Sandy seemed to be spending her time, I think in the living room with a different circle of friends. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after these messages. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. There's a lot of question as to could Keith and Sandy have run into trouble outside of the apartment complex? It's entirely possible. There was some coming and going, cars in the parking lot, other apartments were kind of part of this whole party. And we just heard something interesting that Sandy was actually going to a party the next night. Mm, at the mm -hmm. same complex. This is a place where a lot of students live, and I'm sure there was a fair amount of social gathering went on at that apartment complex. I was thinking about this later, and I thought to myself, I hope there wasn't anybody who was living in those apartments that wasn't associated with the school. <laughs> right. I guess Friday and Saturday nights were like party central. It starts Sounds to sound like, like a dorm almost with you know kids coming and going and, and having a good time. As we understand it then, Keith and Sandy make a departure, we think, to be home by a 2 a.m. curfew. I think Keith had committed to having Sandy home by 2 a.m. And how long would you say the drive is from Newport News to her parents' home in the Grafton area? It would depend on which road you decided to take, but I would say maybe 20 25 minutes, maybe even less than that, depending on traffic and so on and so forth. Hopefully not too much traffic at 1.30 in the morning. Right. Well, you would hope. So yeah, pro probably about 20-ish minutes right around in, in that area. One of the stories that seems to come up for us again and again that we hear um, concerns one of our, I'm not going to call them a favorite suspect because that doesn't seem fair really to play favorites in this way, but we have heard reports over the 
here is the last couple of them, that some people who maybe didn't belong at a college party necessarily, who may or may not have had in their possession a very large snake that particular evening. So do you want to talk about our suspects with the snake? This has been a frustrating one. We've never been able to nail this down. So in other words, no one's ever said to us definitively, I was at the party. There were some older guys there who were often mentioned as suspects or persons of interest, as our friends in law enforcement would say. There was an older guy. And remember, older could be anyone between 25 and up (laughs) because most of the people at this party are pretty young. They're 18 to 22, maybe. Yeah. College age. And we've heard rumors, and I mean persistent rumors, but unconfirmed rumors. And if you hear some frustration, I'd love somebody to come forward and say, yes, I was there. And yes, there were two older guys there. And one of them had a snake, like a boa constrictor type snake, Mm -hmm. a big, noticeable fat snake, (laughs) not something that you would hide in your pocket. Yeah. But we've never been able to confirm that this actually happened. So there's kind of two parts to this. One is, and we're hearing some new tips, by the way, that some of these people, these kind of perennial suspects, may actually have been at that party. No mention of a snake, (laughs) which is fine with me. This becomes like this kind of strange feedback loop. As the years go by, you start to hear some of these same details But you're not sure if you're just hearing the same kind of urban legend working its way back around. We actually have been receiving some tips now from folks who, and I say this respectfully, they weren't even alive (laughs) when this happened. So this is fully a generation ago, 33 years ago. They're talking about things they've heard about a party that they weren't even alive for. They've heard about these things from their parents and their Mm -hmm. aunts and uncles and their older relatives. They're circling back around. I know the investigators have mentioned this to us as well. You start to hear the same story or variations on the story over and over again. It's like that game of telephone. There are certain details that are retained and then certain details that continually change. So it's a very frustrating kind of wheel effect, round and round and round. I'm just always hoping that somebody will say, yes, I was there and this happened. Yeah. If there is anybody out there who is listening, who (laughs) was at the University Square Apartments on April 9th, 1988, and can confirm that there were people there With or without snake, we're not sure which we would like better. (laughs) Please let us know. This would help us immensely. I have talked to directly, as have the Colin Haley families, members of the families, spoken directly to a number of people who were there at the party. Nonetheless, there are people who were at the party who all these years later have never been asked about it by law enforcement. And I think this is a failing on the part of the FBI to not circle back with the young people who were at that party who would have been the last people to see Sandy and Keith alive. I don't know why this didn't happen. And I know that there's a story in in the um, Lover's Lane murders where one of the witnesses says that she was stood up by the FBI She's still willing to talk to the FBI 33 years later, and they've still never spoken to her about what happened that night and what her recollection happened to be. And she spoke to Keith at length the night he disappeared. I think that should have happened. I think, quite frankly, that should happen now. No, I agree with you. And again, on the record, if there is anybody out there who was at that party, who is listening to this podcast, who has information that you think might help us, please reach out via private message to Bill, to me, to our social pages. There is still so much that we do not know about what happened at that party that we are very interested in. You, of course, are also free to reach out to the FBI. We are not trying to say that you shouldn't. You should. But if you have information, you are listening and you are willing to talk, please make sure that you let us know because we are very, very invested in what happened to Keith and Cassandra. Uh, We think a big part of solving that mystery is going to be learning what happened at that party. So at some point, Keith and Sandy did leave the party trying to get Sandy home for her two o'clock curfew. 
At that point, we do not have a good idea of what happened. What we do know is that the next morning, on the way to work at Anheuser-Busch, Keith's father did see his son's car on the parkway. He stopped just to take a look, make sure it was his son's car. Uh, And Keith did have specialty license plates on his car that said Kiefer, K-E-I-F-E-R. It's pretty easy to see that it was, in fact, his son's car. When he didn't notice anything amiss, he probably came to the conclusion that maybe any parent would, which is that, okay, probably kiddo is okay. He just maybe had to leave the car for some reason or another, mechanical, whatever. And he proceeded to work at Anheuser-Busch. The next part of the story gets a little odd. Well, it appears that Mr. Call didn't see anything out of the ordinary. And we get into more detail in our next episodes with Joyce and Chris, it appears that National Park Service Rangers removed items of clothing from the car. And then after hearing that this case might be more serious than a just a couple of kids gone skinny dipping or something, the Rangers appear to have returned to the vehicle and replaced Keith and Sandy's clothes. As you mentioned, we'll get into more detail next time. Let's address the skinny dipping question here for a second, because I know that there are people who would probably look at that and go, well, yeah, it was April. They were on a date. Why wouldn't they want to go skinny dipping? We can go ahead and and allay that here. We can go ahead and lay that to rest. It just doesn't Um, work. It doesn't work. Water temperatures are in the 40s. It's early April. The spot where the car is found, now keep in mind, they're supposed to be pushing to get home for a 2 a.m. curfew. And by your own estimation, and I think it's fair, Kristen, you think it's going to take 20 minutes or so to get from Newport News, where the party was, back to Grafton, Mm -hmm. where Sandy's parents lived, in order to deliver her by 2 o'clock. And no one's tapping their watch, apparently, according to the Haley sisters. Their mom and dad were pretty easygoing about this stuff. What doesn't make any sense is, so they're going to stop to go skinny dipping in Mm -hmm. April and the location where the car is found is pretty high on a bluff that must be 25 or 30 feet above the water. And as the Haley sisters discussed with us a couple of weeks ago, it isn't the best location for skinny dipping, even if you're going to assume that that's what happened. And then, of course, as the Haley sisters pointed out, it was an extremely unlikely occurrence to start with. I think it was a bad theory from the word go. It's amazing how things like this, where they'll just say, well, they were skinny dipping. And then everything seems to be built around this incorrect assumption to start. It's just foolish to lock into this idea. Well, they went swimming and they drowned. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't. If you look at the press coverage of this case, it did start with the idea, oh, Coeds drowned while skinny dipping. But it quickly evolves past that in the coverage. I have been lucky enough to have access to Joyce Call Canada's extensive file of research that her father kept on this case. And the evolution and reporting on this very quickly moves away from, well, probably they were skinny dipping and drowned onto other like more sinister, I'm kind of saying that in air quotes, more sinister motives there. But yeah, the the idea that they went skinny dipping and drowned was something that the FBI, according to the newspaper articles that I was reviewing before we started, apparently they took that and took that off the table fairly quickly. I'm literally sitting here shaking my head because I I can't believe anybody wasted any breath about this. Mm -hmm. And then what I think was lacking in the beginning, although in talking to the retired FBI agents who headed up the case, they insist this was not the case. They insisted this was not accurate, that they had actually talked amongst themselves, perhaps not publicly about the fact that, look, this is only a mile or a mile and a half away from a very similar pull-off where a young lesbian couple was brutally murdered a year and a half prior. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to think to themselves, wait a minute, we may have a problem here. According to the retired FBI agents, 
and the special agents in charge, they were taking this very seriously from the get-go. From the perspective of the Haley family and talking to the Haley sisters, it sounds like in those moments before the FBI took the investigation away from the National Park Service, quite frankly, it sounds like a train wreck with a lot of sloppy detective work and an uncontrolled crime scene, people climbing in and out of the Toyota, dogs actually being led in and out of the Toyota. I mean, you think back, and yes, the standards of 1988 were very different from the standards of 2021, but even by the standards of the day, it sounds like just a mess from a crime scene perspective. It definitely does. And for the first couple of days, this did not start as a murder investigation. It started as a an investigation into the disappearance of two people. So some of the artifacts that I have in Joyce's collection that she was kind enough to give me access to are things like missing posters. There were plenty of local organizations that offered rewards. Mr. Call worked at Anheuser-Busch. He actually worked with my dad at Anheuser-Busch. Here's that local connection. I know, Bill, we've kind of marveled before at the fact that we seem to know so many people who know so many other people who know something about the case. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's, it, I work with people who know members of the various families. It's actually not a surprise anymore to run into people who have a Parkway story. My dad did work with Mr. Call at Anheuser-Busch, and uh, one of the articles that I, I keep in my research binder is a poster offering a $1,000 reward from the Teamsters Union, my dad is a proud member of, that was offering information leading to the capture and arrest of the person who uh, had presumably kidnapped Keith and Cassandra, because that's, that is how it was approached at the beginning, that someone mm-hmm. had abducted them. But at some point, of course, that had to turn into the idea that it was a murder investigation. Bill, at what point, to your knowledge, did the FBI start looking at these two cases on the Colonial Parkway and the case at Ragged Island and start considering whether or not they may be linked? Well, our recent interviews that we did for the Lover's Lane Murders television series with former SAC's special agents in charge, Irv Wells and then Joe Wolfinger, two friends who were both the special agent in charge of the FBI Norfolk and Newport News offices, they both acknowledged to us that there was a public discussion and a private discussion at the FBI. Publicly, they were kind of trying to dispel fear and not drive panic and that sort of thing. Both of them have privately acknowledged to us that by the time we get to case number three, the disappearance of Keith Call and Cassandra Haley, it's very clear there's a problem. Now, they're not 100% certain that all of these incidents are related, but now they were definitely connecting the dots and saying, we do have a young couple disappearing a mile and a half and a year and a half after Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski. And they threw everything they had at the case. They actually set up at the Duke of York Hotel and had basically an all-hands-on-deck investigation that is where every agent in the office dropped what they were doing and worked exclusively on the Call Haley disappearance. And they recognized privately only that they thought they had a problem and they might be dealing with a serial killer at that point. But again, no one wanted to say serial killer. No one wanted to create a media firestorm. There was already a lot of interest around the disappearance of Keith and Sandy, but it becomes very apparent that at least the potential is there for some sort of serial offender operating in their midst. And the case does get a little more interesting when you consider what our friend Andy Fox has recently brought up, the idea that there may be other cases that are linked to the Colonial Parkway murders that were not of couples, but were of single individuals. Especially around this time period, you had two cases that bracketed Keith Call and Cassandra Haley's disappearance, and that is the disappearance of Laurie Ann Powell and that of of Brian Pettinger. Bill, do you want to speak to either of those cases? 
Both of those cases, and we've received new tips in those cases in the last few weeks, which we've passed on to the FBI, including information that we never had before, which is very interesting, highlighting the potential liberty security connections, keeping in mind that Lorian Powell and Brian Pettinger, both of whom were killed in separate incidents, both of them had worked at liberty security. We also had a Liberty Security Connection, which is a bit more tenuous than a direct employment relationship like we had with Lorianne Powell and Brian Pettinger. Robin Edwards' mother, Bonnie Edwards, had worked as a receptionist at Liberty Security, and Terry Haley had dated a former Newport News and later Gloucester County deputy who had moonlighted at Liberty Security. So we have these connections, some direct and some less direct, to Liberty Security, but that becomes an area of concern and kind of a potential through line of offenders or potential offenders that may have owned or operated Liberty Security. We did hear speculation that Liberty Security may have been headhunting Keith for work at Liberty. Is that true? It is true that it has been reported to us. We don't know, and frustratingly, no one in the Call family is aware of that. But we had heard unconfirmed reports that Liberty Security, which was later purchased and renamed Advanced Security, may have been looking at Keith, who was a good-looking, young, athletic college student type. And those were the kind of people that they were hiring for these security jobs. And they provided security at a number of different stores in the area, Rose's Department Store, Mm -hmm. some of the Little Sioux convenience stores, and other retail outlets. That's an intriguing possibility that's still out there and actually has recently moved back onto our radar with new information that we've passed on to the FBI. It is interesting that over the years, as we have covered this case together and have thought about it and worked through it and have looked at all the various leads and details, it is always interesting the number of tips that we get in that may have led us away from one theory, but then we circle back around to it again later. It has been very interesting, the number of tips relating to liberty that has come up over the last couple of months for us. That is something that we're fascinated to see. We're hoping that it will play out fairly soon and see if there is actually something to this. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Mind Over Murder. Next week, we are talking to Joyce Call Canada and Chris Call, siblings of Keith Call, who will talk to us about their experiences with their brother's disappearance. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.